I think the purpose of today's um, kind of like fireside chat was to talk like honestly about what it's like to take such a new technology into a large incumbent insurer <coughs> like Hiscox. And I think it's a really interesting journey from POC to prod with a few hurdles and you know the need to kind of get really broader buy-in to, to make a solution like ours firm-wide. So I think I'm gonna start with you, Matt, mm -hmm. and I'd like to talk to you about your first experience with Reinfer, what you first thought of us, first of all, and you'd seen a lot of um, kind of uh, technology solutions in the market. Uh, first of all, you should probably introduce yourselves <laughs> before anything else, but I think it'd be good to start with you and your kind of uh, experience first interacting with us as a business. Okay, no problem. So my name's Matt Church and I work for Hiscox in what's ostensibly the innovation department. So four years ago when I started in my role, I spent a lot of time out meeting, meeting various startups to try and understand what was going on with the insure tech landscape and what sort of things might be of interest to us. Um, as a result of that, I met with, with as I say, lots and lots of, of companies, either startup or, or later than that. Being, um, you know, in the, in the role that I was in, it was important to be able to identify very quickly whether or not there was an opportunity to be explored with the companies we met. So when I first met with Reinfer, um, the thing that first attracted me to them as a company was that they actually had something tangible that you could look at and understand how it actually worked. So there's a lot of companies that were doing AI, a lot of companies doing machine learning, but uh, it was intangible, the kind of... What, what, what they were actually offering, was it professional services, was it some platform that I would ultimately have to put many, many hours of either mine or, or my colleagues' effort into. Um, but, but when I first met with Ed and Stephen, they, they made it quite clear that there was, there was a tangible platform, there was a mechanism by with which you could have your data analysed and you could see the output of that data on a screen. But I think so, you, were, you wanted to test us, though. I, think I did. I think you were a bit doubtful at first. So I doubt everyone, first off, as soon as I meet them. Um, yeah. and, and obviously, there's, a lot, there's lots of companies that, that I'm sure you guys have met, and, and lots of good ones, lots of bad ones. But what tends to happen is, um, is that the story's great, but then it's very difficult to see that in practice. So what I, what I said to, to, uh, to Ed and Stephen was, if I gave you um, a few thousand pieces of data and just basically just emailed it to you, would you do the business to it and just show me the result. And they said, yeah, of course, that's exactly what we'd do. So I gave them some engagement survey responses that we had. We had free text engagement survey responses that we were getting from our brokers. Um, I obviously knew what they were saying because we had read them all and we had manually analyzed them all and we created our own output from it. I gave it to, to uh, reinfer without any other instruction then. Here's just some feedback from brokers. What they did was, well, they put it into their platform. They did their own um, labeling of the, of the buckets of data that the platform identified as being certain things. And within a week, I don't know, maybe probably even less time than that had elapsed, showed me a visual representation of what that data actually was saying, um, basically an MI stream of, of that data source. And it was incredible because I, got, I gave them no inputs, I gave them no uh, language that we use, no references, no term of reference with which what was interesting to us and what wasn't. But what we saw was all of the points that were relevant to us were highlighted, all of the challenges that we knew we had because we'd read the data and we'd ran the research through were there, but it was all gleaned off the back of 8,000 rows of just pure feedback text. So that was incredibly powerful. Um, and that was kind of our first meeting. I think that's and that when we won what, your confidence. <laughs> it was... It, it, it started the journey. But then we went the journey on. went kind of here, there, and everywhere. We ended up getting pulled in a few different directions by the business to say, can it work on this data set? Can it work on this source of information? And we ended up doing, like, I think a fair few <laughs> proof of concepts in the end. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the, the long, long story short of that part of it, 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 it became very challenging to actually convince the business of the value of what we were doing here. Um, my role as... as Head of Futures, which is what it's actually called, is, is obviously looking towards the future. It's trying to prepare us for the things that are coming, coming down the line and not things that are ne necessarily going to land in the next six months. Um, so I then had to, had to reach out to my colleague Becky to say, OK, there's no doubt that this platform can do exactly what it says it's going to do. As a business, are we mature enough to take advantage of the insights that we can glean from our unstructured data? And that's where Becky was able to to support the successful implementation, I guess, of reinfer. Yeah. 
And I think just in terms of, the, so we started off with uh, kind of the broker kind of sentiment piece, and we did quite a bit. Uh, we did, I think, um, HR information. We did broker to underwriter calls. We've done, and now the big kind of thing, which is similar to my presentation just now, is you know the big, big problem that we're trying to solve in the enterprise, which is like email understanding. And I think that's when you got involved, Becky, right? Yeah. And so Becky is. Um, so I work across, um, so Matt works in the UK business looking at innovation. Um, earlier this year, I moved into a role across our four retail business units. Um, and as part of that role, I'm looking at digitization across those four. So um, knowing Matt from the UK, he, um, he was, I think he had a session booked in with you anyway, anyway yeah. one day. Yeah. And he invited me along and <clears throat> straight away as soon as I saw it. So I'm from a data and analytics background. So I just wanted to throw data in and see more because yeah. I was so impressed by it. Um, but what also, by working across the four retail business units, what I'd gleaned from that is that actually each of the business units were trying to look at NLP in some form and were at, were at various stages of POCs. Some of them, obviously Matt was working with Reinfer and other business units were working with other providers, but nobody had, nobody had nailed it, nobody was really getting traction. Um, but what, what worked out well, it was a bit of luck really, was the timing of me moving into this role and the business unit having a problem that they wanted to solve with NLP, which I think is probably where we struggled to get it over the line before because the business units are all obviously so focused on their day-to-day -day and solving yeah. the day-to-day -day <clears throat> that sometimes they, they struggled to think about spending budget on things that didn't have an immediate um, benefit to the, the current year's plan, basically. But... By the time I came in, everybody wanted to look at email triage, what we could what we could glean from email, specifically from the broker channel. So most of the traffic from broker channel is calls or emails, basically. And that's unstructured. It could be one line. It could be 10 lines. It could be anything. I think what's interesting from our perspective as a vendor is that we kind of, at that point, were thinking, OK, we, we've got this kind of reputation as coming from you know, the UCL AI Research Lab alongside DeepMind. We kind of know the merits of our capabilities and we're kind of confident in that respect and our accuracy and our, you know, the speed of learning. And then I guess at that point, I think there was a few other failed POCs with other vendors, right, which didn't work because there was like you know, some kind of well-known providers because there was like thousands of you know, training examples needed and loads of services needed. And yeah. we kind of were kind of thinking, oh, that, that surely is the reason you know, that's going to allow us to go group wide and get everyone's buy-in but uh, to your point Becky it was actually getting consensus and the stakeholders across these different kind of almost like federal kind of parts of the organization to get something for them yeah. and I think what's interesting is that in this kind of automation market a lot of the early ROI kind of stories have been about you know x percent improvement in processing time and FTE release and stuff, and I think that's that's fine because it's great and it's like really like you know short-term actionable delivery items. But I think that the the market is going to develop. I think as we become more cognitive focused to really understand the power of visibility, like it's quite hard to place a value on analytics. Um, I, I I know that because <laughs> uh, it's my, that's what I spend my life trying to convince people of. But there really is this this like amazing opportunity that once you know I think we got to the board level and everyone started seeing the potential to see inside all of these different channels but rather than just seeing it from like a sentiment perspective but actually seeing okay what is the root cause driver of that work of those customer issues that became a bit of a I think for me like a step change in people's awareness of it yeah I think I think that's fair we've you know you have so what the title was I forget what the title exactly was something about incumbents and embedding yeah embedding things like this and you see, I, I would get quite evangelic about the benefit of, of obtaining insight into data that you didn't have insight in before. Yeah. But unfortunately, the reality of it was is that that, that didn't land it within the organisation. Yeah. It wasn't enough. Um, and I, I began to realise that the gap there was how does the organisation react to that new insight? It's, uh, insight's great. Uh, we do have insight that we don't react to at the moment. New insight <laughs> is just, just another load of things to maybe ignore. Um, which was why, yeah, the, the worlds came together, and and the and the use cases around automation and the ability for this tool to drive those use cases to success was was how this all happened. But I still I still fundamentally look at um, 
the, the creation of structure around an unstructured entity. And not only that, the, the fact was is, is, is changing behaviours is even more difficult than, than trying to embed change with an organisation. So persuading brokers to, to communicate with us in a different way is probably going to be a 25-year <laughs> gameplay. Yeah. Um, so what better than to take the way that they interact with us and, and glean as much as we can from that, from that process, that interaction, we can understand it, the needs, the wants, in the aggregate level. It was, it was, it was what attracted me to reinfer. It was why I think we struggled to embed after the early POCs because yeah. it wasn't enough. Yeah. And it's why it all landed so well when the business had, had got to the position of Actually, we want a war to make, we don't quite know how. Well, this is the thing. I think it's like a paradox. So from my perspective, you know, um, to some context for the audience, you know, uh, there was a, a kind of a central um, need to invest in automation and to bring in some kind of early robotic process automation investments, mm -hmm. of which we are, you know, integrated with one of the um, Hiscox's, you know, um, RPA choices. Um, and that was a really kind of nice, vanilla, um, digestible point. You know, we can email to RPA to remove some FTE. Um, but what's interesting is when we get deployed, as you know, Matt, as well, when you start seeing the actual data, often uh, the decision is not to automate. It's to just rip out the process yeah. or to like change the, the kind of the, inter the interface, something like much more at the kind of the upstream level as opposed to the downstream. And um, it's always bizarre. We have to kind of, I think, for us as a business, as a machine learning kind of deep learning platform, our uh, early manifestations in this market have been to kind of attach ourselves quite neatly to the kind of automation, FTE release train, but often um, that's not the, the eventual decision. It's actually much different. Mm. People go into the deployment thinking that's gonna be the, the quick wins and it often changes. Yeah. yeah, so we definitely found that and that's how we, 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 that's how we had to sell it really, wasn't it? We, we saw the value and what it could bring, but it felt like actually to the COOs we were underselling it because we were saying, you know, this will f tell you how many cancellations you've got, pull out these, and then you can automate it. And we knew that actually the insight they would get from it would be far bigger, but we just knew that message wasn't going to get them to hand over the money. And so, <laughs> yeah. and so we went into it like that, but actually already we're seeing those additional insights. So we're looking at at the moment on one, just one inbox in the UK, the first one, yeah. and already, so yes, it can do exactly what we told the COO it could do, so it can identify it's a cancellation, it can pull out the entity so we can use RPA to automate, but then at the same time, it's looked at the, that inbox and it said, you know, 20% of what's coming into this inbox is actually chasers. Yeah. So if you can get rid of, if you can get your work out quicker, you lose 20% of your demand already, which yeah. is just something there's no way we'd have known before. Yeah. And also, I think, you know, um, when I kind of met with people today here uh, at the conference, you know, you're all kind of representative of global businesses with um, different kind of, uh, kind of um, power structures in each country, in each department. And I remember, like, being in that meeting with, uh, with both of you, actually, when there was all the different business heads. And they all had to literally kind of cough up and pay a bit to get, to get into that was That was the way it worked, wasn't it? Yeah. Not one person was willing to put their name to it, but, like, eventually the consensus approach which you kind of designed I think was, was was the way we got it over yeah exactly we had to um, we basically had to convince them that there was a benefit in terms of FTE and cost saving and spread the cost across the business unit so that it wasn't it that so it was seen as lower risk yeah. basically because as with anything their budget is already set aside for a certain amount of things we didn't have ring fenced allocation for something innovative so they had to see it as an, an amount that they could um, risk, basically. Yeah. So that's how we that's how we did it. Yeah, which worked out. Well, it, it's interesting though because um, so I, I don't I don't know you know the backgrounds of any of you guys, but it, it, it is innovative in, in its own way because it's obviously a piece of cutting edge technology that we couldn't have imagined having like two two or three years ago. But fundamentally, what it what it did demonstrate very early on is that it did give insight. There, there was no two ways about it. If you put the if you put the data in, you got insight out. Mm. So that that was never really in dispute. And, and but what what I was always um, challenged by was was making the value of that apparent. You know, you've got a new revenue of MI. What do you want to do with it? And unfortunately, you've got to close that close that loop. So I'm going to be intrigued if there's any questions about that because you know it's some of the challenges that, that, that I certainly face in my role is how do you close that loop of um, 
something that, that, that works, it does everything it's, it says it's going to do, you know, it, it's obviously proven itself out, and it's a piece of technology that there is no doubt will become ever more prevalent in the future and will almost become a core part of every business. But how do you make sure that, that you take full advantage of it mm. at the right time, in the right way, and, and without missing an opportunity to, to, to challenge and transform your business? Mm. We've got five minutes, I think, left of our session. I wondered if anyone wanted to ask any questions to, to, to the Hiscox team or to myself or... Sure. Are you going to chuck under the bus? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, yeah, there were a number of proof of, proof of concepts going on. Um, could, am I meant to say? Yeah. So mainly with Eigen, and um, so basically what we did. So some business units were relatively happy with Eigen, but we asked one of our group data scientists to just do a, a sweep of the market. Everyone we were doing POCs with. Um, plus anyone else out there and just to give his independent review of like, which one he thinks is, um, is, is the best and Reinfer came out like head and shoulders above the rest. So the biggest difference I think um, with Eigen, so the precision and recall that Reinfer offered was higher um, in terms of accuracy and also it was um, the reason we love it from a, a usability point of view is the, the clusters that Stephen showed earlier and how easy it is to train. So um, with Eigen and, and other providers, you have to pr present you know, a certain number. So in our cancellation example, we'd have to say, you know, this is X number of cancellations. And they would say, OK, now we know that's cancellations. We'll find the rest. Whereas Reinfer does that, that first piece for you and it clusters things together and therefore it gives you insights into things that you don't know you're looking for, which is, uh, I think, the added value on top of what um, the other providers could offer. Anything else, Matt? No, that's covered it. <laughs> One over there, Steve. Yep. Um, seeing as you don't need to train it as much yep. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a great question. Um, first of all, you know, you do have to train it a little bit. <laughs> uh, you use the unsupervised um, algorithms to kind of understand intentionality, right? So across various different types of expression. So our, our models and a lot of the work that we did at the lab at UCL is kind of really highly optimized to understand vernacular conversations. So, like, uh, expressions that are non-standard English, um, where there's spelling mistakes, abbreviations, broken English, and that's what... Um, allows us to be deployed so effectively in really complex B2B channels like capital markets, insurance. Now, in regard to the accuracy question, we, first of all, publish all of our accuracy statistics in real time in the platform, so you can always see how confidently Reinfer is applying a predicted label of what it believes it's, it's talking about in the email or the chat or the call, right? But um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we have kind of understood that there's a scalability problem in machine learning and an adoption problem. So when Facebook has, uh, you know, its ability to recognize faces, kind of unhappy cats, f smiley cats, that's because there's been an enormous amount of training data applied to those examples, labeled thousands and thousands of examples that have usually been annotated by a human. You know, it's very hard to kind of get um, existing training data sets, or supervised data sets in the enterprise, right? So we use the unsupervised approach to learn from your data and kind of do this kind of the heavy lifting of the clustering. But then the users really like, it's all about overlaying all of their domain knowledge into the training in that kind of discover interface. Now, if you wanted to get a 99% accuracy rate, yeah, it's not going to be 10 confirmed examples. It's going to be a lot more. But what you get in the platform is this um, real-time, validation graph so you can see how confident reinfer is applying say the margin call full agreement labels versus a new label that's just been identified so all of that's transparent and it's meant to be iterative and intuitive so that you can actually get it to where you want it to be if it's to kind of drive a straight through process you might want to have quite a high accuracy state uh, 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 statistic and we give you the platform to do that and achieve it
So th there's, a, there's a couple of ways that you can approach, approach the accuracy piece. So you can um, determine that, because there's, I, I'm not entirely certain of all of the, all of the terms, but you know, is it, how confident is it that it's found the right subject as opposed to how confident is it, given all the subjects, it's found all of the right subject within there. So what we, what we saw with, with very little training is that what it had identified was accurate, so was, was very accurate. So cancellation, for example, you could look at 100 of them, and they would all definitely be cancellations. So that, that's the kind of confidence level we wanted, as opposed to the model saying, well, there's 10,000 cancellations that we found 9,500 of. We're more interested in saying, what you found, is that accurate? And then building upon that to then, because the accuracy is obviously going to come from additional training, but cancellations, for example, is, is, a, is a simpler one because it tends to use a handful of terms. But when we looked at, um, for example, feedback or commentary, that's one where you, where you don't have to be, you don't have to know 100% that you've definitely got everything in the right box because you, you're more talking in, in general broader terms because you're not taking specific action off, off the back of it, you, you're gaining the insight. So it did depend on the use case, but I've, I've, I know that the most recent models, we've put more effort into training than the previous ones from the, from the POCs, but they were all business-driven. So they were all, uh, it all could be delivered by a business analyst, mm -hmm. you know, who doesn't necessarily have to be a deep expert in the subject, but just has to be able to label things in the way that the rest of the business is going to understand. I think also, like, yeah, like, that's the thing that we're trying to optimise for, is that you know, reinfer is not like pre-trained, it's not pre-cooked, it's not like trained in a vacuum, and then it's like, applied to your data and it like it's brittle it kind of breaks which is what you know traditional approaches have been like the reason we take this approach to learn from your data then to learn from your um, domain experts is because we want it to be quick to set up in a new channel so like some of our banking clients have like 4,000 shared mailboxes you need to make it very fast to set that up and to train on a new channel in a matter of hours not in months and weeks mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're really optimized for any our time? Okay. Well, thank you very much.